Um, I'm going to get going here in just one minute. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sandy Watts. I'm going to uh, do a few housekeeping things and then we'll go into our webinar and get get going. Um, first off, um, this webinar is a uh, intensive uh, partial smoke loss webinar. We're going to be talking in great detail about um, how to get your uh, smoke loss, your partial loss claims resolved. And that's all we're pretty much going to talk about today. I've got a lot to cover. So um, I'm going to ask that people keep comments um, with uh, respect to ALE and, um, and so forth, uh, unless it's directly related to smoke. Um, keep it for our next Q&A session um, and try to keep everything directed towards um, smoke claims and insurance uh, uh, related smoke claim. So, and then there is a Q and A button down on, on mine. It's on the bottom uh, right. Please don't use chat. If you have the chat box there, please don't use chat to ask questions. Um, you can talk amongst yourself if you'd like to do that. But we're not going to monitor the chat box for um, questions. We're going to use the Q and A, and we're going to try to get everybody's questions answered. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our. PowerPoint, I'm gonna share my screen here. And, sorry, it's always right exactly where I need to start my slideshow. Okay, there we go, and we'll get started. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, if you haven't been uh, to one of my webinars before, my name is Sandra Watts. I'm a project coordinator and um, educator instructor for United Policyholders in our Roadmap to Recovery program, um, dealing with people like you, survivors of disasters, um, trying to help people get through their insurance claims. Uh, my background is insurance claims and claims management. I was a 25 year employee um, with State Farm uh, in claims and claims management and some other various things there. So I come to you uh, with quite a bit of claims experience. Um, and I'm also an IICRC certified fire and smoke uh, restoration technician. So I have a bit of knowledge. I'm not going to claim to be the most knowledgeable uh, fire and smoke person out there. There's a lot of uh, people who've been doing this for a really long time. But I do, um, I do have that background. I'm a former um, co-owner of a SERP Pro franchise. So Got some, got some experience going there, so hopefully it will help you out, okay? Um, for those of you who might be new to United Policyholders, wanna tell you a bit about our organization. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to be a voice and information resource um, for insur insurance consumers in all 50 states. Um, we've been around. Um, next year, we'll mark the 30th year of United Policyholders. Um, Amy Bach, who is our executive director um, and co-founder of this organization, started way back after the fires in the Oakland Hills. Um, so we've got a lot of subject matter expertise in insurance and disaster, re disaster recovery behind us um, that it will also is here to benefit you. Um, all of our work is funded by grants and donations. Um, we're not for profit, not for sale. That keeps us um, impartial, allows us to voice our opinions without uh, political pressure. Um, we have a huge volunteer corps. Um, people, a lot of them are people like you, people who have lived through prior survivors, used our resources to help get themselves back home and come back later and volunteer with us. So always keep that in mind. And we also have a huge group of professionals. We have attorneys, public adjusters, um, accountants, CPAs, um, all sorts of people, um, all sorts of um, people in the um, uh, volunteer arena also that help us and support us and allow our small company to really make a big impact. So thanks for joining us. Okay, 
So fine print, uh, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only. It's not legal advice. I am not a lawyer. We do have a lawyer, uh, Mark uh, Dilberg, our staff attorney is here tonight with us. Say hi, Mark. He's probably muted. Hi everyone. Yeah, finding that mute button. Hi, there everybody. he is. He's muted. He's going to help with some of the questions. Um, even though Mark is a lawyer, he's also not going to give you legal advice. Um, so just so that you know, this is just general information. Um, we do have a list of sponsors and a lot of times we point you in that direction to try to, if you need professional help, um, we don't warrant them, but we do know them. They're people we have um, relied upon for years to help us. Okay. So let's get right in. I have quite a few slides and quite a bit of information to go over tonight. Um, these are our topics. We're going to talk about smoke and its byproducts, evaluations of damages, um, testing for smoke residues, equipment and protocols for remediation, estimates and estimate reconciliation, and then resolving disputes. So we do have a lot to cover. Um, and like I said, if you have um, any questions, just pop them up and we will take a look. Um, okay. So let's talk about smoke. Um, unfortunately, I should, you know, this has uh, been a fixture in our lives in California for the last few years. Um, we certainly have a lot of it um, that we've had to deal with, um, but now you're going to, to know more about smoke than you ever wanted to. I think I spelled born wrong there. Anyway, uh, smoke, the definition of smoke is airborne solid and liquid part particulates and gases that are produced when a material undergoes partial combustion. Okay, I'm gonna go through a bunch of the things, the components of smoke, just so that you get a little bit of background. Um, and it's gonna seem kind of weird, but it's gonna be helpful as we progress through the, through the webinar. So, okay, so uh, smoke itself is made up mainly of two different things. Gases, which are invisible vapors, okay? Lots of these are highly toxic. They're carrying whatever material might have burned, okay? And a lot of, a wide variety of different things burn when you have an urban slash rural wildfire like we have here in California, okay? However, once the smoke clears and dissipates, most of the gases cease to be a problem. There's a little bit of um, a fallout, but most of the gases do dissipate. So in addition to gases, smoke also contains aerosols. Those are aerosolized. Those mean fine particles, okay, of matter and liquid droplets that are in the smoke. And these are the things that actually settle on the horizontal surface and get into things and cause, um, and cause odor. Oh, we've got somebody having a hard time hearing. Let me see if I can do something about that. Does it matter? Is everybody else hearing me okay? I'm always such a loud person. It's kind of, um, it's, always, it's always funny to me when people tell me to, to speak up. So hopefully there you can, uh, you can hear me. Okay, so whoopsie. Let's talk about wildfire smoke. Um, okay, everybody else seems to be hearing me. So hopefully um, you can resolve there. Okay, so wild fire smoke contains quite a bit of airborne particulate matter, okay? And what that's defined is the sum of all the particles that are suspended in the air um, as a result of the wildfire. You've heard these terms, smoke, char, ash, soot. You've also got a bunch of pollen. You've got vegetative matter and other things, okay? This is what makes it up. So let's talk a little bit about um, the size of, of smoke particles, okay? Um, if you guys went to my first smoke webinar, you've heard me talk about this. I've snagged a little um, diagram from my um, uh, manual, from my um, certification manual. Thank you to TM Restoration Schools for this. But this shows you how small the smoke particles can be, okay? And the average size, so if something's completely combusted, so completely burned, the range can go all the way down to 0.1 microns. It can go so, so small. And these circles represent um, different things. So this is the blue circle is the average size of a cross section of a human hair, okay? And the yellow is how small you can see down the, uh, by the naked, the human eye. 
um, which is about 50 microns. And then this one little red dot here represents um, a smoke particulate, and that's about an average size. So it's very, very small. And the, the importance to this is, is that it's small and a lot of what is in your houses can't be seen. Now, I'm not, um, I try not to be alarmist. I'm a pretty um, moderate person in terms of how alarmed to be about uh, smoke and the par particles in your house. But the fact of the matter is it's very well established that um, a lot of the things that you cannot see are also quite harmful. So that's why it, that's why it matters. Um, and we'll get to that with respect to um, adjusters inspections and things like that as we go along. Okay, so let's talk about the different kinds really quickly. Smoke um, is basically, you know, the, the stuff we talked about before, and it's incomplete combustion of the carbon-based materials burned in the wildfires. Okay, very small particle size. Char, now char, ash, and soot are the things that remain after the smoke has dissipated, okay, after it's cleared. Char is big stuff, okay, generally, well, relative. Everything's relative. Um, generally bigger than one micron. And the thing that differentiates char is that it retains characteristics of whatever it was. So if it's a piece of a tree, a lot of times somebody with a microscope could see it's a piece of a tree, okay? Ash, on the other hand, is the residue left after complete combustion. So the thing that burned is completely burned and the ash is just carbon and it's completely gone, okay? Soot, is also the um, you know after effect, and it's fine black particles, mainly part, uh, mainly carbon, plus some res residual gas particles. So I was talking about gas generally dissipating. Well, some of it, um, some of the molecules, kind of attach to the pieces in the soot, and then they fall down. Soot um, can be especially if combined with moisture, can be acidic and damaging to things, especially like metals and so forth. Not as big as a problem in wildfire losses as it is in like, say, house fires. If you have like a kitchen fire and your house fills with smoke, um, one of the first things you have to do is like wipe all of your um, faucets and things like that because um, the acid in the soot starts um, corroding them really quickly, okay? Okay, so and what's the difference? Okay, so I talked about this a second ago, but um, most smoke particles um, are invisible to the naked eye. Okay, so it's important to know that there's stuff you can see and there's stuff that you can't see. Um, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Okay, um, and then there's a the difference in ash and char. Um, the composition of what is in the residue in your house depends greatly on the materials that burned. So when you have a wildfire, you know, there's a lot of grass, there's a lot of vegetative material, um, trees, um, other people's houses, but you also get things like vehicles. You get somebody's uh, paint shed that's filled with paint or somebody's chemical shed that's filled with chemicals. Um, I've seen situations um, in wildfires where, you know, part of the garage burn, they saved the house in a wildfire but the, um, some of the contents in that garage released chemicals that became a really big problem to, um, to the, uh, okay, to the, uh, the inhabitants of the house, okay? Okay, why does all this matter, okay? So um, the UP, our big thing is knowledge is power, okay? And in this case, knowledge is going to help you get your home properly restored, get you back home. You can have informed conversations with restoration professionals and adjusters. Um, it's important to know that you can't see all the damage necessarily. Um, it's also important because there is a trend toward insurers using visibility of smoke byproducts as a threshold for measuring damage. And I'm sure, unfortunately, a bunch of you have um, had that conversation with an adjuster who walks in and says, hey, it looks pretty good to me. Um, and and that, that's, that's why it's important to know that a lot of the stuff you can't see. Um, it's also important to worker safety. Um, and while that might be kind of odd, um, I've also heard a lot of people um, whose adjusters have told them, you know, have merry maids come in and so forth. Well, I, you know, I have some real concerns about um, regular um, residential house cleaners coming in um, without any protections and doing 
you know, going through and doing a bunch of these houses and they're really getting um, exposed. They're getting some long-term exposure to some of these particles that are maybe not so good. Um, and also it matters because everyone who lives in a house has a varying degree of sensitivity to these particles and this, and the, um, this smoke residue. So um, it is important to know what you're dealing with and you know, what's going on. Okay, so now we know that. We know that about smoke and char and ash. So now what? Um, your objective, you need to be clear and set your objective. And that objective should be to restore your home to its pre-loss condition. You know, you wanna move home. Everybody wants to move home, but really in order to do that, you need to bring your house back to its pre-loss condition, okay? And there's some steps that need to be done in order to do that, okay? You need to have a comprehensive and detailed evaluation of all of your damages, okay? And this needs to be done by qualified professionals. Um, I capitalized qualified because um, you'll get a lot of people in your house telling you a lot of things who are not qualified to do that. Um, you'll need to get both a scope, okay? And that a scope is what needs to be done and an estimate, which is how much will that cost, okay? And through this, you're gonna get insurance adjuster estimates and restoration company estimates, and you're gonna have to figure out what to do about it um, and how to use those to get what you need to get your house cleaned, okay? So that's our objective here. Okay, so let's start with evaluation of damages. Who is qualified to evaluate damages, okay? So first off, you as the homeowner, you do have some qualifications for this because it's your home and you can show testers, adjusters, or mediators, you can show them the affected areas. You're gonna notice things in your home that other people don't. Now you're also gonna have situations where other people notice things and bring it to your attention, which is what, what we need. We need everybody looking, okay? Um, so let's talk about your insurance adjuster. Um, a lot of them get very offended when I talk about this, but I, um, I'm gonna stick by it because this is, it's the truth. Um, it is my position that insurance adjusters can confirm the presence of smoke, okay, that there's enough there to authorize professional remediation. So they can say, yes, there is smoke that needs work. What they can't do is determine that there is no damage and remediation is not needed, okay? And it's very clear. Um, a lot of them feel very, um, very strongly about their opinion about everybody else's house. Um, and, you know, I get, I get a lot of stories in terms of what their adjuster tells them. You know, I'm somebody, I have 17 kids and grandkids and this place is perfectly fit to live in. Um, I don't smell anything. This is perfectly fit to live in. It looks fine to me. Those are all, you know, different things um, that adjusters have told people. Um, and so, We'll get to that, we'll get to what we do when that happens, and we've talked about it a little bit um, in prior webinars, but we'll keep going. But that they are not qualified to tell you that your home is safe for reoccupancy, in my opinion. Um, they're certified remediation technicians, IICRC certified. Um, again, and that's the certification that I have. That is the most common certification. It's the most recognized, not necessarily the most common, but it's the most recognized industry standard for smoke remediation technicians. So again, these, these technicians can, um, can confirm that you have damage. They can um, base the cleanup um, recommendations on what that they observe when they're inspecting your home. Um, certified remediation technicians cannot determine, again, just like your adjuster, they can't tell you that there's no damage and remediation is not needed. Um, they can give a better opinion than your adjuster in that they've seen more. However, again, some of these particles are so small and there is no human with their naked eye that can tell you um, that it's completely safe and that there's no harmful byproducts of the smoke there, okay? Who can do that? Certified industrial hygienists can do that. Um, they are the cream of the crop in terms of determining um, extent of damage, what kind of substances are in your house and so forth. Um, and then there's also indoor air quality professionals and indoor air quality um, testers, both of whom can um, do investigations and tests and tell you, um, you know, what your damages are, what you have, what types of byproducts you have in your home. Okay, 
Okay. So people ask me a lot of times, when do I need to have my property tested? Oopsie. Keep hitting it there, trying to get that to go by. Okay. So there are, and you're going to get maybe a few um, differing opinions. I feel like my opinion is sort of a pretty middle of the road opinion. You're going to get people who say anytime a wildfire comes through, it must be tested before anybody goes back in, blah, blah, blah. You can't go back in. It's not safe. You have to test it every time. Then you get people who say, ah, we've all lived with smoke. We've all sat around a campfire. It doesn't bother me. Um, you never need to have it tested. I'm right smack dab in the middle. Um, I think personally um, that when your non-qualified, non-certified, non-trained adjuster um, declares that your home is perfectly safe and habitable and only requires standard cleaning, um, but you have a reasonable belief that it may contain smoke residues, then that's a time when I think you might need testing. If your adjuster is saying your home does not require smoke remediation, but you feel you, you feel there's an odor, you feel like there's some um, any sort of danger to your family, um, then I think that is when testing is warranted before the cleanup. Um, also, the insurance companies have to take their customers as they come. So if you or a family member, your child um, has a medical condition that makes you vulnerable to exposure to smoke, um, then you might need testing, especially if you have a sensitivity to certain items. If you know that you have a sensitivity um, to like say a VOC, you know, a vol volatile organic compounds, something like that, you can get that specific test done to make sure that um, your medical condition isn't triggered by reoccupying the house. Um, you also need testing if you personally want or need post remediation peace of mind, or if you need a post remediation medical clearance in order to um, in order to reoccupy. Now, Diane is asking, would a company like ServPro be considered a professional indoor air quality tester? Um, and we're going to talk about these remediation companies quite a bit. Um, first thing to know, ServPro, Service Master, um, I'm pretty sure Restoration Management, um, those are all franchise, okay? So the important thing to know about them is they vary just like people. Um, some of them are very good, some of them are quite awful, some of them are ethical, some of them aren't. Um, some of them have some qualifications that allow them to do air quality testing, some of them don't. Um, I personally wouldn't use a restoration company to do air testing because there is sort of an inherent conflict of interest there. Um, it behooves them to find damage. I would um, I would get a third party to do that. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't do that. They can um, give their professional opinion in terms of if they see damage that they think needs to be remediated, they can comment on that. Um, and then Emily's asking about advice on convincing an insurer to pay for testing prior to cleaning if my family members have a, um, a serious medical condition and then what about after? So let's talk about that. Um, and then Jen is asking who should pay. And some of these are down the road a little bit in my presentation, but let's talk about that. If your adjuster says, yes, your home has visible smoke that triggers um, our authorization to do professional remediation, then it's my opinion that you do not need a pre-remediation um, testing. Unless, Emily, um, and everyone, like I said, if you have a specific sensitivity to something that you know might be in um, wildfire smoke, um, and that can be tested for if it's something like a heavy metal or something like that, that you know you have something and you need to know if it's in there, um, then you could maybe have it tested beforehand. Um, otherwise, if they, if they go ahead and authorize the remediation, um, then you can wait. And I would say it's very, very unusual for an insurance company to pay for pre-remediation testing and post-remediation testing. So personally, if I had a vulnerable family member, I would have, um, I would, when I told the 
remediation company, when they were making, um, when they were, I'm gonna save some of these questions for a minute. Um, when they were making their estimate, I would talk to them about um, the fact that you're gonna need post remediation testing um, and clearance. It's called clearance, saying that the home is safe to reoccupy. They kind of need, I think it's important that they need to know before they do the cleaning, um, just to make sure that they know that they have to pass. Um, and then do the testing afterwards and before reoccupancy. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Teresa, I'm gonna get to though your question a little bit. One of the things is, is Teresa asks, would smoke remediation include a garage that's attached to the house? Yes, it would. <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> whether you live in it or not, it would um it would apply. Okay, so let's and I'll talk about the clothes in a little bit. Um so who should do the testing, okay, um, if you need it? Uh, certified industrial hygienists are the most qualified. They're also generally the most expensive. Um, they can run between, you know, about 25. I might be a little high on the low end there, maybe 1,500. Um, but they can go all the way up. I just saw one that was about $10,000 on a really extensive, um, extensive loss. Um, and you can get indoor air quality professionals. So these are just... Um, you know, environmental companies that do testing. A lot of companies um, make their bread and butter on lead and asbestos testing during construction because of um, various uh, regulations. So a lot of those companies, they're qualified enough to do the testing and, um, and send it to a lab and get you some the results that you need. They're a little bit more cost effective. I've seen them down to about uh, $600. You wanna make sure that they have good protocols good chain of custody. You wanna really interview these people before you, um, uh, before you hire them. And then also you can use a certified remediation professional. Um, they don't, you know, they can do like um, testing with chem sponges and things like that. And often that can be enough. They can take pictures and give enough to trigger coverage with your adjuster. Um, and a lot of times they're free or maybe you just have to pay their service call. So those are all people who could do the testing, okay? Um, so what you want to do, the purpose of the testing, um, if you're going to do it. So, so when I'm talking about it right now, so Emily said, would you trust do it yourself kits for testing? Um, we might want to talk about that later. Um, I don't think so. Um, mainly because in, so the situations I'm talking about right now are going to be situations where the adjuster has said you don't have enough damage and you're going to need a hygienist or something like that. And Emily, I'm going to take the questions at the end. Okay, so let's leave. I'm going to try to get through this and I see your hand. So let's um, let me go through this. And then Mark, if you leave the questions there, we're going to let's go and we'll do them. Um, sure. we'll, we'll do them uh, sort of more at the end. Um, and I'll keep looking at them so if I can get one right in the stream. Um, but I don't think I would do a do-it-yourself um, test. Um, what I, okay, so, so what I'm talking about now is um, if your adjuster says, um, you know, your house looks fine, you just can have Mary Maids come in. And so now you really do need it tested um, in order to get that coverage triggered, okay? or if you've done the remediation and you're coming back and you're getting a post remediation clearance test, okay? Um, so you need to think about what items and locations need to be inspected, how they're, if they're swabbed, how they're tested. Um, oops, I should have fixed that. We don't have a handout on that, but um, we can talk about that. Um, I wanna talk about commonly overlooked areas, um, finding a certified industrial hygienist, um, we really hesitate on that because a lot of times, you know, we'll say, whoopsie, we'll say somebody, you know, we recommend and somebody doesn't like them. And, you know, so I would um, use your word of mouth in your community to, um, to find people who are doing good work. There's also an indoor air quality association, IAQA. And they have um, a list of certified hygienists in the area. Um, I'm also aware, and it might be worth it for you guys to go online, Butte County 
um, where they had the paradise fires, they had a list of certified industrial hygienists that they recommended. Um, if somebody asked me, I think I posted it somewhere, but um, we'll do that. So then you say, you know, if I hire the independent expert, what testing will they do and how much it will it cost? We kind of talked about that. Okay. So um, some of the things that you want to make sure you point them to if they're doing testing is commonly overlooked areas that have smoke and ash stuck in them. Um, one of the common things that we get um, was uh, indoor air quality. Um, people, you know, complain about the smell, the odor. Adjusters say, well, we don't insure the air, we don't cover odor removal, and so forth. The very important thing to remember is odor does not spring from nowhere. Odor comes from particles that you can't see that are in your house, okay? So that is very important. Um, and so you're not, they're not insuring the air and they're not cleaning the air. They're cleaning the house that cleans, you know, keeps the air clean. Uh, make sure people look at ducting, um, especially if your AC or heater was turned on at the time of the fire, if you left the house. Um, a lot of people don't think about it. You shouldn't have to. Um, attics and crawl spaces. Attics and crawl spaces have vents. Um, Fire, um, I won't get into it too much, but it's pulled into areas. It's like, um, it's like weather. Um, so fire is hot and it gets pulled into cold areas. So attics and crawl spaces, they go right in the, and kind of pulls it in the um, vents. Um, insulation, insulation acts like a sponge and it just soaks up all of that. It's almost never salvageable. Um, underlayment or sheathing, any sort of really porous area. Um, I've talked to a bunch of people in the um, Santa Cruz mountains. There's a lot of cabins there that have exposed wood. Um, very porous, very quick to take up the smoke odor, much harder to get it out of, okay? Subfloors and wall cavities, okay? Um, okay. Keep moving, just seeing that there. Um, okay, so when you get the tests, okay, what, what findings matter, okay? And what are the good testing methods? How should they be reported? What do the reports look like? Um, should you get a remediation protocol or not from your tester? Um, and these are all really important things to think about, okay? So first off, why do the findings matter, okay? Knowing what possible contaminants are present in the structure assists the restoration professional in choosing the proper types of filtration and cleaning products needed for proper and complete remediation, okay? It also matters because if your adjuster has said that you have no damage and the testing comes back showing that you have smoke or char or soot or whatever in there, then it's gonna prove your damage. So that even matters more. I should have written that on the slide. Okay, so let's talk about testing methods that these people should do just so that you can have an overview of what they should be doing when they're testing. Um, so you can kind of ask them questions and, and keep track. But the first thing that they should do is they should do a visual assessment of your home. What can they see? And I didn't write it on here, but they should also do an interview with you um, about um, how close the fire was. Oh, they should do that themselves as well. They should show it on a map. Um, but windows were windows left open? What was the main direction that the fire came from? asking you if you've seen areas of particular concern and so forth, okay? Um, and then so the different testing methods, they do soot, char, and ash dust wiping. Um, they do tape lift sampling, which is um, similar to wiping. So the wiping is basically they put like an alcohol-based solvent on a something, a little uh, piece of material and they wipe it and then they evaluate it under a microscope. Tape lift sampling is basically, you know, taking an area, putting the tape down, pulling it up, and then that gives them a representation. Tape lift gives them a representation of how dense the damage is. So like they count, they put it straight down in certain areas and then they count the density of the, um, of the particles and that sort of gives them a, um, an idea of how much damage there is too. Um, bulk air sampling is when they sort of close off a room and they create negative pressure and they pull, they have like a machine that pulls air 
through a filter and then out the other side, then they take that, they run it for a specific amount of time and it's a specific size. And then they take that filter and they can um, look at it under a microscope and get an idea of what's in the air and how much of it is there as well. And they also do micro vacuum air sampling on soft goods. Um, okay. um, so sample reports. So one of the things you're gonna find out is that there's a wide variation in reporting styles, okay? Um, the depth and the detail of the report kind of depends on the extent of damage and the extent of your concern about health hazards, um, like I said, if there's a vulnerable person. Um, they need to make sure that the chain of custody of the samples is documented, okay? And what that means is, is that the person who takes them, labels them immediately, keeps them in a secure place, and every time that sample changes hands, there's a sign-off. So when you um, take the sample, you write it down, what where it was taken, what your name is, you know, what time, all that stuff, who, who the people are. And then when they take it to the lab, they, you know, they say, okay, this has been in my custody. I took this sample yesterday. It's been in my custody since yesterday. Now I'm dropping it off at the lab and then the lab signs off on it and so forth. Okay, lab testing, and this is really important, it should always be done, done by an independent lab and not a lab associated with the testers. Um, some people will tell you they have their own labs. Um, I don't believe in that. Um, I think it's, I think it's an, again, an inherent uh, conflict of interest. Um, also, when you get your reports, your results should be quantified, meaning they should give you numbers of particles. It shouldn't be yes or no, like pass, pass or fail. So that's really, really important. Okay. So this is just an example of them chain of custody. These are swabs, see these swabs and they're labeling them, and these are, I don't know what those are, but those are, and these are the, some microscopic slides and so forth, so that's chain of custody. Okay, so sample reports. Um, this is just a little snippet, um, and if we were in a live audience, I would ask all of you guys, how many of you already have reports? Um, okay, I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, but this is kind of an idea of what um, you can expect to receive, receive in terms of, they're talking about how they take the samples here. They took samples of suspected soot-like particles and they collected them by wiping the identified areas. And he has a, a two square inch area um, with 70% isopropyl alcohol, collected bulk samples enclosed in a sterile case. So they're talking about their um, testing protocol here. So how they did it, and they did a little high volume pump and they took it to an independent lab. Okay, so that's where we're looking at all of that. Okay, so here's an example of a, when you get the lab report, this particular graph, and you're gonna get like a big report. I kind of struggled a little bit over how much to include in the slides, um, but you know, we can only, only show you so much, but this is a representative and this was um, the chain of custody, okay? The laboratory was sent 12 tape lift samples, three microvac surface tape lift samples, um, which were received and analyzed, okay? And so what they should do, they have the samples number. This is a very nice, um, nicely laid out report. Talks about where it is, the exterior southeast window track, 10% char. So usually you'll see that they put um, in bold when they get um, uh, amounts that are past the acceptable levels. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So this just goes through and it lists them all. Um, ND means none detected. So these are the areas, what they saw, and there's quite a bit of smoke and char in, in this house, okay? Okay. Standards, okay, so let's go back. Let's look right here. So here are the relative, so this is, a, this is the amount of char. This is um, some dust particles, you know. Um, one of the things that your report should talk about is background levels of things like dust and so forth because they can kind of mess um, everything up. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to answer this one now, Leslie's. If there were, uh, no, I'm sorry, holiday fire. Um, if I was evacuated by the holiday farm fire, we were evacuated for over three weeks. Air quality testing was done much later. Is there a time where things settle in the air and aren't as easily detected? So um, that is a question. That's most of these, if you'll look here, most of the testing that you're gonna see done is actually done on horizontal surfaces. So that is allowed, you know, all the, a lot of the particles to come and settle down. So as long as they're, um, counting horizontal surfaces, you're going to be fine. And in fact, the longer you wait, the more they're going to settle. Um, some of the very, very small particles remain aerosolized. They remain in the air for kind of a weirdly long amount of time. Um, so, uh, but you'll be fine if you do, if you do these uh, surface samples. It's, it's the air cartridge testing, which you don't see as often as the surface testing mainly because it's harder to set up. You kind of have to contain the room. Um, it, it's harder to set up. It's a lot more expensive. Um, so this is really more common seeing the lift samples. Okay, so back to these percentages, okay? I, wanna, I want you guys to look at those. And then we'll talk about standards. One of the things that you might have heard from your adjuster who's you know, out there telling you everything is that there are no standards for, um, you know, to determine threshold levels of smoke damage for restoration purposes, okay? They don't exist, um, <laughs> which is kind of true and kind of not true, okay? So standards are things that professionals can rely on and say, once we hit this threshold, we can declare there's damage and so forth. So right at this very moment, the IICRC, which is that, um, it's like the in Institute of Inspection, Cleaning and Restoration, um, they are the ones that put out the standards. They put out a water standard, a mold standard, a, you know, a toxic chemical standard, you know, um, biohazard, all these standards. So right now, the standard, which is the S700 for smoke and fire, does not exist, okay? It's pending, they're rewriting it. There was some um, copyright problem with it that apparently caused a little court scuffle, um, but that's been resolved and they are rewriting it with a group of professionals. But in the meantime, they've also pulled all the historical standards. So they pulled all of the standards back um, and that was because of that copyright interest. Now, a lot of people say that means that there's no standards, but that's not really true. There's just no reference um, to, to open up and point to, you know, at this time. Um, but there's been a lot of people doing a lot of testing for a lot of years. And it's generally recognized that if you have um, greater than about two to 5%, you know, the two, 3% is a judgment call on some people. Um, but once you get to the five, it's recognized that you do have affected um, affected areas and the background reports should address um, I'm sorry and the report should address that as well as background measurements of things that you have just in the background okay so one of the things you want to do is identify when you're reading your report you want to identify red flags and I'm going to give you an example of a red flag so this is the same report um, it's interesting because they have, if we go here, the attic, I cut off the HVAC, but they said less than 1% of char, and they've got some dust, and they've got, and they're saying that the attic is acceptable, okay? Really um, unusual, I'm gonna tell you. The attic is usually the most damaged place. Um, the times that, I mean, some people don't have attic vents, but most people do. Um, it's a, you know, it, what I would like to see in something like this is why there are no recommendations, okay? Were there no vents? Were there, was it inaccessible? Was it so, so when something says no recommendations, um, I think that they should put in their, um, especially something like the attic and the HVAC, they should put in their reasons for having no recommendations. Um, and what I would probably do in the attic, I actually did look at this house, um, it was hard to get inside, um, but there were vents and there was insulation that, that smelled, you could smell it. Um, so what I would have recommended perhaps is after the, um, 
after the remediation, test it again and see if there's, once, once they kind of get more access from the um, insulation being out. Same with the HVAC, um, no recommendations. Did they not have one? You know, it could have been that they didn't have one. Um, with ducting and so forth, was it off? Was it, you know, did they do a thorough test? You know, did they, because sometimes, you know, they'll test it like the cold air return or something like that. And that, depending on like the direction the fire comes, where it came in your house, um, you're like, my cold air returns right over here, but the fire may have come in you know, downstairs on it from a different corner which could have been sucked in through a different vent. So they, you know, they need more to back that up. And so in this specific um, report, I would um, go back and ask the provider, like, why don't you have any recommendations? Um, and so one of the things that you shouldn't hesitate to do is to call these people and ask for explanations. A lot of people like, um, will get it, they'll either take it at face value or they'll say, I don't like this or I don't, you know, I think this is wrong, or I have a question, pick up the phone, you've paid for these, pick up the phone and talk to them until you completely understand and are happy. You might not be happy with the results, but are happy with the explanation of what's going on. Okay. Um, so one of the other things that I didn't do a slide on is um, whether or not you should ask your testing company to provide a protocol for remediation. Um, and I should have put, um, if any of you want to see one, I can, I can send one to you. But basically what a protocol is, is that the testers say, okay, well, we found, um, we found high concentrations of this and this and this um, at this place. Um, so you can either just report the results or they can go on and, and make another step and say, okay, well, because we found so much char on the Southeast exterior, um, we recommend, you know, power washing the exterior, cleaning the windows, blah, blah, blah. So you can have it where they do a protocol. You need to be very careful about it because one of the things that, and, and really in the beginning, I do not necessarily recommend getting a protocol straight out the gate. A, it'll cost you a little bit more, and B, sometimes you have to sort of live or die by them. Um, so if your um, hired um, expert doesn't mention that you need to, or for instance says you don't need to do anything in the attic, you're gonna have a tough, a tough time. And these are actually, this one did have a protocol that I should put in there but um there was no recommendations for a protocol in this for the attic um and so then you're like you have to backpedal and say hey look there's actually more work that needs to be done here so my recommendation is to not have a protocol done unless you get into a beef with either your adjuster or your restoration company if somebody thinks something needs to be done and somebody else doesn't think it needs to be done then you can ask them to do it. Um, we do it in litigation and things like that. Um, but for you guys, um, basically, I wouldn't do it. What I would do is I would provide a copy of that. If it's a, if it's a pre-remediation testing, I would provide a copy of the results um, to the restoration companies to allow them to, I, to do the protocol. Okay. Some of them might ask um, if it's a really big case or if it's a really um, contentious case, they might ask for the tester um, to give a protocol. Just, just proceed with, with caution is all I'm going to say there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about getting remediation estimates. Now that you've got it, you've said, okay, look, adjuster, um, here is this test. Here are the you know, proof that I have this stuff in my house. Now you need estimates, okay? Um, so in order to get them, you need to make sure that the identified, the affected areas are identified, the places that you need to clean. Um, termination and protocols. I don't even know what I wrote there. I don't know what termination is. <laughs> Sorry about that. I might mean terminology. Whoopsie. Um, you need to have your adjuster inspect and estimate. You need to get restoration professionals, some companies who can do the cleaning, come in, inspect, and give you estimates. And then you need to go through those and reconcile, make sure you've got everything covered and you've got the right amount of money. Okay, so that's what we're going to focus on next. Okay, 
And before we get to the estimates, I'm going to go through a few things just so that you, and I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. So you get um, sort of um, used to some of the terminology. But one of the things that I'm seeing left off a lot of these estimates is um, personal protective gear. Okay. Um, these particles are very small. The HEPA vacuuming is, is there for a reason because you don't want it circulating in the air. Um, PPE should be included in every estimate that has a smoke protocol, okay? Because they, the workers need to protect themselves. You don't want workers coming back saying, you know, I breathed a bunch of nasty air in your house and now I'm sick, okay? And also there's a lot of um, treatments at the end that remove odor um, and the treated area has to be vacated if you're not wearing respiratory protection. I'll talk about that too, okay? So here are some of the PPE gear. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we're kind of... Um, familiar with a lot of this, but this is just a, just a list. But the main thing being um, respiratory protection. That's the number one thing. And then certain people have chemical sensitivities. Um, you know, one of the other things that um, if you need to do um, more extensive testing, the testing that I was talking about and showing you earlier was just tape, you know, the smoke soot and char in order to get that threshold met so that you can have professional cleaning authorized by your adjuster. But a lot of times um, there is testing that you might need for um, VOCs if you're, if you're um, sensitive to the volatile organic compounds and there's some other, some heavy metals and some other things um, that you might need to have tested for too. And if those are in your house, you know, they might need, um, more protection than just respiratory protection. Okay, so smoke remediation equipment, just to get you uh, familiar with this, this is a HEPA backpack vacuum. These things are great. They're, HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air Filter. Um, this one's the first step in smoke removal. Okay, this is a, we call them air scrubbers. This is the kind of slang term for them, but these are HEPA air filters. These should be running while the remediation is going on in your home, okay? And you might get some adjusters pushing back and saying, you know, we don't insure air, you know, blah, 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 blah. But when we get to the protocol, you'll see why these are important. Basically, the, when you're HEPA vacuuming, it dislodges particles. You can get most of them, but it dislodges them, puts them into the air, and this machine will pull those particles out of the air while they're doing the work. It's very good for protection of the workers. It's very good for protection of the occupants. I love these. And when, we had, when I had a surf pro franchise, I used to bring them home and run them in my house because they make your house smell great. Um, when you're dealing with fire losses, um, these have either two or three filter systems that you can use. They have um, one or two pre-filters and then a HEPA filter, which is the big, big daddy. Um, and when you're using um, these for smoke claims, you should always have a carbon pre-filter um, because that does grab VOCs out of the house. It removes more of those, any toxic air particles that could be around. Um, and if you look at this, these things are really powerful. This right here stands for 500 cubic feet per minute. So you got a cubic foot of air, you know, one by one by one foot of air in your house. Um, and in a 938 square foot room, oddly specific. Um, this machine, this little machine, which is about, I don't know, it's about three by three. It's pretty heavy. Um, we'll do four air exchanges per hour in that room, removing almost 99.97% of particles down to 0.3 microns. Um, one of the things I want to say about why you use these and why people use these is that um, your home vacuum cleaner um, when it sucks things in, it has to vent the air out, okay? And if you don't have a HEPA filter on your vacuum cleaner that is of very, very good quality, um, they're just going to spew all of that stuff back out into the room. So vacuuming your own smoke, while it will get rid of the big pieces of char, it will not get rid of the small stuff, okay? It will just shove it back out in the room and circulate. It'll actually make things worse. So you do need a high um, HEPA, high efficiency. And I would say, you know, I have a little, you know, a Miele HEPA vacuum, but I don't think it is quite as effective as these big ones. Okay, and then you have these running to catch whatever gets out. Okay, 
And then there's a lot of uh, talk about ozone and hydroxyl generators. This is an ozone generator. And basically what it does is this thing shoots out O3 particles. So oxygen is O2 with two electrons. This shoots out one with a third electron. And what that does is it allows that particle to grab onto other particles. It's trying to get rid of its third electron. So it gives it to something else. Um, and what happens is the binds with the particles and um, the particles fall out and the, it leaves just O2. Um, there's a lot of uh, debate on whether or not ozone generators are safe or not. Um, I certainly wouldn't be in the building while they're being used. Um, I personally think that they're pretty safe afterwards if you ventilate afterwards. They do require air movement, so this little um, unit's going to shoot them out, but you need air movers to send the ozone around the house. Um, people, pets, and plants um, can't be in while you're doing it. It's not good for plants. Um, it also has some negative effects on um, plastics and vinyls and things like that. People either love them or hate them. They're not used as much as the next one, which is a hydroxyl generator. This is a newer technology um, that breaks apart um, the molecules that cause the odor. So both of these um, pieces of equipment actually neutralize, they eliminate the odors. They don't just mask it. There's a lot of things, thermal fogging, um, different things where they put a little fog that has like a scent in it. If you come home and your house smells like cherry scent, um, then they thermal fogged your house. That covers up the odor. Um, it does not neutralize it. So I would be a little bit wary. Um, so these hydroxyl generators are generally um, the safest way to remove the airborne products. Um, they dramatically reduce VOCs. So these are something you should push for. And they do need some air movement. They, these need some air movement as well. Um, to get them around and they generally cover about a thousand square feet depending on like how high your ceilings are you might need um, And then also depending on how Porous like if you have like I have like just drywall walls, right? They're super super smooth my walls um, But I've been like talking to people up in the mountains that have cabins with like rough sawn wood very porous and um, these hydroxyl generators will actually get the stuff in the wood and, and neutralize it, but it might take longer. So um, just know that based upon what your house is built on, it might take longer to get that out. Okay, so this is just the difference between the two of them. You know, this one shoves all the stuff out. This one, the hydroxyl actually does, it also pulls air through, purifies it, and sends the hydroxyls out. Generally a little bit safer, that's just that. Okay. So now that you're familiarized with some of the equipment that these people are going to use, um, let's talk about a protocol, okay? Um, there is a little saying in the restoration industry that says, the first rule of odor removal is to remove the source, okay? And that's usually, you know, if you caught your kitchen on fire, get the pan out and the stove out and so forth. But in these cases, you know, if you have something that's particularly saturated or some particularly burned nearby trees or something like that, try to get it, try to get your yard around your house cleaned up as much as you can um, so that you're not tracking it in and out and that'll really help. Um, we'll talk about textiles, but you should remove the textiles and soft goods from the structure. Um, my snarky comment on that is any adjuster who doesn't think you need to clean them, I wish we all had, um, they had claims offices nearby because people used to just like drop them off and say, okay, smell this. Um, I won't smirk. Um, you want to clean the structure and the contents simultaneously. I know that there's people, you know, whose landlords are working on their house and then they have contents. You can, if you're, if you're going to have to do it separately, do the structure first and then the contents um, because the structure obviously has things that are, you know, higher up. Um, and it'll settle down on the contents. So um, either do it simultaneously or structure first. They should start at the ceiling and work downwards. Okay, smoke rises. I have heard story after story about people having um, a restoration company, who we will not name, coming in and only cleaning as far up as the people could reach. Um, that's not gonna work. Smoke rises, that's why we stop, drop, and cover, you know. Um, so it stands to reason that a lot of the smoke is going to be up on the ceiling. Um, you work downwards, that let, lets the particles settle as you're doing it, run the air filter while they're doing it. 
you do the dry removal of the particulate matter first, and that's the HEPA vacuuming. If you have more than just light smoke, sometimes you need to wipe down um, the hard surfaces with just a general purpose detergent. Um, it's a little bit, usually a little bit um, alkaline to counteract any of the acidity and the smoke. Then you do the ozone or hydroxyl or thermal odor control um, at the very end. And then if you come back and there is a persistent smell, um, sometimes you have to do sealing of porous surfaces. A lot of times um, it's, very, it's, it's fairly common to have to go in and seal the attic framing. Um, because if, if the attic is completely filled with smoke, um, those boards, um, definitely the framing lumber definitely uh, fills up with, with all of that. Um, okay, so now let's talk about estimates. Okay, and this is, um, you guys are probably going to go nuts because the first thing I'm going to say is the adjuster's estimate should be detailed and quantified. Okay, and I'm gonna show you why. Um, because if it's not detailed and if it's not quantified, there is no way to compare it with the remediation professional's estimates, okay? Pardon me, talking, talking. Um, there is something called the California Homeowners Insurance Bill of Rights. It's insurance code 10103.5. And it states that an insurer must provide an itemized written scope of loss within a reasonable time. Now, they're probably gonna tell you that they've done that and I'll show you the lumpy um, estimates that you guys are getting. Um, I would use it to push that you need a detailed estimate. And let me show you why. Okay, I think probably a lot of you have seen these lump sum estimates where um, the insurance company has um, made a deal with a restoration company um, that they're category one, two or three, I have three on the next page. Um, and that for each category, there is a price and there is a protocol. Um, okay. Sorry, just looking at the questions here. Um, and these are, this is, this is an example. I pulled it straight off of someone's um, estimate. Um, it is, I'm going to tell you it's a farmer's estimate and I'm not going to be shy about saying that I am not amused by farmers and service masters, uh, agreement that they have going forward. Now, I'm not going to uh, slam all service masters. There are some that are perfectly great. There are franchises. Um, but I think that what's happening here is sort of um, shoving it, shoving service master down your throat. And if that's happening to you, I will um, give you some tools that will help you. Um, but if you've seen these, so what they do, you know, category one's worth X amount per square foot, category two's worth Y amount per square foot, and this is what they're gonna do in each one. So look at category one, for instance. They're only gonna clean the horizontal surfaces, okay? Don't ask me what a normal volume of contents is. It's just a swag. Um, they're gonna vacuum up anything that they can see, okay, visible ash, <laughs> and then they're gonna damp wipe all surfaces and contents, which is a pretty big thing to say. They're gonna HEPA vacuum upholstered furniture, carpets and drapes. They're gonna clean the kitchen, bathrooms, um, fixtures and counteracts. It's I think countertops is what it's supposed to be. And then clean exterior of contents and surface items. So items not in drawers, cabinets, et cetera. So they're only gonna get the outsides of things, okay? And let me just tell you that category one, two and three do not exist in the professional restoration world. It, this is just a, this is all a shortcut. Okay, so category two, it's everything up here. Plus they're gonna, they're gonna do some dry cleaning of your upholstered furniture. They're gonna steam clean your carpets and rugs. They're gonna vacuum your clothes. I'm still just dumbfounded by that. Um, it's apparently a thing, it is not my thing. Um, limited wall ceiling and interior window cleaning. Okay, so what does that mean? If I was the homeowner, it's like, what do you mean limited ceiling wall and interior window cleaning? What, you know, what is that? This is not quantified. And then a higher volume of contents. We'll go to page three here. Here's category three. Um, HEPA vacuum, visible ash, and damp wipe cleaning of all surfaces and contents. Okay, you guys, that's one of the reasons I talked about the fact that you can't see a lot of smoke particles, okay? You have to HEPA vac everything. 
Okay, if you've got a moderate, you know, a decent amount of particles, you've got to do it. They're going to also HEPA vacuum your drapes. I guess your drapes weren't going to get cleaned before. Um, in category one or two, I'm going to tell you that drapes are the number one smelly thing. Okay, and there are no, no HEPA vacuum drapes here, so I guess they're going to do it. But um, vacuuming of clothes, cleaning of all wall, ceiling, and interior windows. So that's pretty good. Um, and then excessive contents. I don't know what greater than 70% means. Um, and then if you have a higher vaulted ceiling. So this is category three. So this particular estimate, um, this is an adjuster's estimate. It's a uh, farmer's claim. Um, so they took the square footage of the house and this is their agreed upon category three price. Um, and then they just multiplied it out and there you go. Um, this here, I kind of cut it off just for sake. This is cleaning the surface area. This is exterior, okay? Light sweeping or hose down of exterior surfaces, okay? This particular house was about 600, 650 uh, feet from the fire line. So this house was very close. Um, this, I haven't seen it myself, but I would um, assume that they probably need a little bit more than light sweeping or hosing down of their exterior surfaces. And then they added in um, the negative air fan. You get it for one day, um, and then you get a hydroxyl generator for one day. And then this is to clean their entire garage. I don't know, 320 each. This is just, this is one of those things where you see something, um, you need to ask, what, what is this? I mean, what do you mean? 320 garages? Is it 350 square feet? Whatever. Um, that is $115. You can barely clean anything for that. Okay, so this is the adjusters. This is just bits of the adjusters estimate. So let's go to the, uh, the restoration company's example. So this claim actually happens to be, thank you very much for the donor um, who gave it to me the other day, um, because it gave me tons of, of content here, um, better than what I had planned for this. This is actually the service master bid that the service master gave to farmers to give to the insured. So then the, there was some pushback. And so the adjuster, instead of answering the question, just bumped it, see here. So service master gave him a category two and the adjuster's like, okay, we'll give you a category three after you complained, which I guess is better, but it's not um, great. So um, this is the restoration company example estimate. And this includes, so if you look at this, this is everything. Hand dry cleaning, upholstered furniture, steam cleaning carpets, rug vacuuming of clothing, limited wall ceiling and interior window cleaning, and then a higher volume of contents. They've got one day of hydroxyl, one day of negative air. Um, they've got one half of a furnace service call. I'm not sure what that's all about. So that's something you'd go and go back. Okay, so this 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 is the same house. Okay, these are all the same house. This is this is great. This is restoration number two example. This is a much better estimate. Um, this is even though it's still a lump sum. Um, this is on location contents cleaning, um, and it talks about consumables. They're not very good at spelling, but it it does everything. It's got the HEPA filters. They've got all their equipment and they've got all their labor for cleaning, contents cleaning on location. Um, they've got a price, this is that. Does not include clothing, okay? Very, clothing or textiles, very important, okay? Very important, keep that in your, in your head. Okay, then you have interior structure cleaning. Um, the same thing, they talk about what they do, on-site content manipulation, they've got the cleaning technicians, they're gonna clean on-site. Again, no textile cleaning. But here are the prices for contents. Here's the prices for the structure. Um, okay, now we, this is the last one. This is the third one. This is a different way they estimated it. Um, this this um, restoration company has two, I don't know why it has two air filters, um, but they have the hydroxyl for six days and a negative air fan for six days, and then they just do all of theirs on cleaning technician. This is an hourly. All hard contents and dwelling, driveway, carports, and this person said all soft contents should be cleaned by a textile company off-site. Okay, very important. 
If your restoration company says that to you, get them to write it down, okay? You need to inundate your adjuster with the fact that these restoration companies shouldn't be, um, they need to take the soft contents offsite and clean it offsite in the proper way. Okay, so this is another one. This is contents and structure, no textiles, okay, important. How do you compare these, okay? So here's the summaries that you get. Um, so this is, this is number one, this is restoration company one, this is service master, this is, now it says summary for dwelling, but we know um, that this is everything. This is um, structure and contents and textiles, okay, $5,481. Number two, um, I think this was a serve pro bid, this is structure only, the contents and textiles, they actually separated it. They, there's another one that says summary for contents. Um, I just ran out of room, couldn't include it, and they asked the textiles to be taken out. Um, so there's the price from them. And then you've got number three, which is structure contents and no textiles. So this is structure and contents, no textiles. Very hard to compare, okay? So when the adjuster goes back, um, you know, he has a tough time, he or she has a tough time uh, comparing and then policyholder you guys are really stuck saying hey look it doesn't seem like I have enough money if I get fifty four hundred dollars for everything and I've got one bid for just my structure at 67 and I've got one for structure and contents but no textiles at 75 what am I supposed to do okay and we'll get to that and um, this is the summary of everything so this is the adjuster's estimate for the same claim using uh, the restoration company number one, which is Service Master, but they changed it. This is the one they increased um, out of the goodness of their heart. Structure, contents, and textiles, plus some other items like insulation, that weird HVAC half charge, and then some debris removal and so forth. So this is the total right here, $84.55. This is the $5,000 deductible. This is what they had paid them on their original estimate. So you can see that they were $2,500 low after their first visit. Okay, this is what an estimate should look like, even though I wrote it. Um, uh, but this is what it should look like, okay? This is how they are done. This is how you compare what's being done. This is how you know what's being done to your house and how much it should cost, okay? So same house, this is just the kitchen, okay? They had to move some stuff around to get at it, but you go through, you clean the light fixtures, you HEPA vacuum, the walls, ceilings, and floors, okay? You clean the windows, you clean the outlets and switches. One of the things that happens is that um, the outlets and switches, because there's cold air in the back of them, they draw some smoke to them, so you really need to clean those. Um, you've got to detach and reset the range because um, the refrigerator leaked all over the floor after being there for a month. We'll not talk about that today. I'm, I'm on a rampage about that. Um, so they need to take out and reset the gas range in the refrigerator. They need to clean the sink, the faucet, the hood. They need, to, um, they need to fix the floor and they need to clean the floor. Okay, so this is just, this is, if you look at these and when you guys get these from your adjusters, sometimes your head just spins around and there's so many pages and they're so detailed that a lot of people sort of give up. But I really encourage you to try to get in and look and try to make sure that like the, di the dimensions are correct, okay? And that, that things look right and then that things are here. Do you have, um, I actually sent this to the homeowner and um, I said, if I'm doing it, I might as well do it right and you can use it. Um, and he's like, oh, well we have three light fixtures in that room and we have, you know, three outlets and two switches and, you know, and so forth. So, this is really, if you get into these, and I, I, it's like how to eat an elephant one bite at a time, I really encourage you to, to go slowly and to try, to try to decipher it and fix it and take your red pen and mark it up. But uh, unfortunately, you're probably not getting these. So let's just go through. I, so this is the adjuster's estimate with everything, the one I showed you earlier with the 8455. So this is structure, contents, textiles. Okay, this is the detailed estimate. So this is this for every room. And this is only the structure. This is only, you know, the house itself. It does include the, um, the insulation and um, the HVAC and so forth. But look at the difference. 
8,400. And so these are almost identical, but this is just the building. And the reason that this is compelling, and if you can get one of these from somebody, is that when you go, when you're adjuster, and I'll show you copies of the letter that this guy received um, from his adjuster. But when you go back to your adjuster and they send you these ridiculous letters saying, you know, we, we're not going to pay you anymore, you'll have something and you can say, look, which, what part, these, these are all standard Xactimate pricing. This is the, Xactimate is the software program that the insurance companies want, they use, and they are adamant that you use the pricing. Well, I never changed a thing in any of the pricing. This is Xactimate pricing, and these are all things that need to be done in the house. So if, for instance, you know, the adjuster says, you know, this is too high, it's like, well, what part of this um, do you have an issue with? Um, they can't get too deep in um, protocols in terms of saying, well, you can't use an uh, air scrubber, you can't do this. The restoration companies are the professionals who call out what needs to be done. And so that, but if they say, oh, well, look, you know, you have three light fixtures, but there's only one. Okay, that's fine. You correct it. But what else? Everything else here needs to be done. So it makes it very hard for them to dispute. Okay. And it, it, it focuses the dispute instead of on this bottom line of these lump sums, it talks about what needs to be done. These are the unit pricing that the insurance company has accepted. So they can't really do much. So this is a huge difference, okay? This is the textiles taken out, no contents cleaning, they should be separate, um, and that's a big deal, okay? So I wanna show you what the adjuster did in response to, um, so the adjuster hasn't seen the detailed estimate, I just did that yesterday, but they did see the other estimates, okay? And um, the policyholder turned it in. Um, he, the, uh, this is the adjuster writing to the homeowner. Your letter states you've received from various contractors um, do not include textiles, okay? Because all of the restoration contractors that this person had says you need to take them out and have them cleaned by others. And we'll get to that. Our estimate to you includes your clothing and soft goods, aka textiles. Further, our estimate includes the cost of cleaning all of your furniture. As we have communicated previously, our estimate is to bring your home, including the contents, to pre-loss condition. We all agree we want that. We further provided you with an estimate by a third-party vendor who advised, okay, you guys take note on this. This is really, really important, okay? Um, a third-party vendor who advised that they are able to complete the work as estimate, bringing your home, including contents, to pre-loss condition. You always have the choice of a contractor, but it does not obligate us to pay higher than reasonable costs to bring your home to pre-loss condition. Although we appreciate your providing the additional documentation, it does not provide us with additional information that would alter our current estimate and whoopsie, and therefore no payment is due. Okay, I have a huge issue. That, all of that is in violation of the California Unfair Claims Practices Regulations, okay? I'm gonna go through the other letter. Um, it basically says the same thing. We've supplied you with our experts finding in our letter dated October 2nd. Their estimate includes the resolution of all of your subject clothing and soft goods. I've attached an additional copy, which not only includes, this is when he bumped it up, okay? So here's the deal, their expert. Okay, first off, th this idea, the, the, the inherent conflict between the insurance companies and the restoration companies. I understand they need to work together. I used to be a franchisee, I get it. You know, people need their house clean, insurance needs to pay for it. There needs to be a common ground. This is not a common ground. This is this company saying, hey, we're gonna give you a whole bunch of work if you give us a set price. It's, it's price fixing, it's, it's ridiculous. The other thing that's happening, and I really, if you're a farmer's person that's having a problem with, and I don't mind saying this, if we've got some farmer spies here, um, go to the Department of Insurance and complain about this relationship because What's happened, and it's probably happened to some of you guys, is this guy went in, um, made all sorts of notes. I'll show you the, well, the regulations say, you know, you have the right to choose your own contractor. I have a slide on that later. And they're saying, yes, yes, yes. And they're saying it again here. You get to do use whoever you want, but we're only gonna pay you what our guy estimates. And 
as an extra added bonus, our guy can do it on Friday and be done by Saturday. So your ALE is cut off on, on Sunday and you have to move in, even though you can't get your own restoration contractor in for two weeks. Okay. Huge problem. Okay. Huge problem. And to me, um, people need to be holding their feet to the fire because that's forcing people to use their provider or forcing people out of um, additional living expense housing that they're entitled to to have their room, their home cleaned properly. And I've also heard some, some problems with the cleaning, which would be a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so what do you do? Okay, what do you do? So you need to review their estimate for accuracy, ask lots of questions. Um, how did they get the square footage without a diagram? If you go back into these estimates, there's no diagram. How do they estimate for half an HVAC? So what you want is an itemized detailed estimate if you can get it, okay? And then, and if you can't, you know, fine. But under, and I'll show you, I'll show you why later, but then you get your restoration company estimates and you need to get documents from the restoration company regarding the cleanability of your contents. So it's commonly um, known that mattresses, bed pillows, um, are, are there's, there are things you sleep on. You spend all your time on it. They're very hard to clean. You can't wet clean a mattress, okay? So those should be, if you've had a significant amount of soot and smoke in your house, those should be um, non-salvageable. You should get your restoration company to send you something saying, A, your um, textiles need to be removed from the house and professionally cleaned by another company and B, your mattresses and um, bed pillows need to be um, regarded non-salvageable and thrown out and replaced, okay? Get, excuse me, get letters from your restoration company to back up those, those concerns, okay? Um, yeah, get them to move the claim forward. Hold on, let's see. Um, this is, this, what this slide is about is getting an expert or your contractor to help document your damage, okay? So that you can go back to the adjuster, okay? And in this case, you know, it's the textile issue, it's the mattress issue and so forth. Get them to help you, okay? No, and then this is, I'm gonna get to how, how, what to do with it in a second, but what kind of expert? Know that there's a lot of different people out there. There's, besides the restoration company, there's electronics people, artwork restorers, appliance people, mechanical, HVAC people, um, textile specialists. One of the things, if you got, if you have a significant amount of smoke in your house, um, the carpet can be cleaned. The carpet is generally cleanable. The problem is the pad. The pad acts like a sponge. So if you guys have seen that pad and you see it, it's like chopped up rubbery stuff and then they smush it down into a pad and they put it underneath. It's very hard to get stuff out of there. It acts like a sponge. It acts like a filter and it pulls things up, okay? Um, so use specialists to help you, to, to send you letters, to write you, you know, notes that say you need to do X, Y, or Z, and they're professionals, okay? So now we're gonna get to why I was so outraged by those letters, okay? And this is, and I am apologize greatly for the length of this, um, but it's really, really important. So if you go and Google California Fair Claim Settlement Practices Regulations, Go down to 2695.9, subparagraph D. Okay, and these are very important. So if losses are settled on the basis of a written scope and or estimate prepared, and these, I highlighted this, by or for the insurer, okay? Service master's calling them their expert, okay? Right there. They, they simultaneously call them experts and independent. So it's like, make up your mind which one. Um, let me tell you that if, they, if, if the restoration company that they forced on you did something wrong, they would throw them under the bus in two seconds flat and put up their hands and say, we're not the restoration company. You go deal with them. They're the professionals, even though they've been you know, playing them like a marionette the whole time. Um, so service master is preparing, and I'm sorry, I don't usually call out insurance companies and, and restoration companies, but this is what's happening right now, and it's widespread, so it's not, it's just, it's just happening. Um, so 
if they, if they prepare the estimate for the insurer, the insurer has to supply you with a copy of each document upon which the settlement is based. So my policyholder knew that, wrote a letter, and that's how he got the um, service master document. And then it came back with the increased amount, which is interesting. Okay, it shall be in accordance with policy provisions and an amount that will restore the property to no less than its condition, allow repairs to be made in a manner, you know, trade standards, da, 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 da. Um, they have to do reasonable steps to verify that the, um, the protocol is right, okay? So now we're getting to the meat of it. If the claimant, that's you, subsequently contends based on a written estimate, which he or she obtains, that necessary repairs will exceed the written estimate prepared by or for the insurer, the insurer shall, okay, shall, it means no, it doesn't say may, it doesn't say maybe, it doesn't say might, it says shall. There's three subparagraphs under this, and these are the only options. There are three options and three options only. First is pay the difference between their estimate and your contractor's estimate. Always an option. They can, and you'll see it sometimes. Sometimes an adjuster will write an estimate, an insured will get an estimate, send it in, the adjuster will pay the difference. It does happen. Um, number two, if requested by the claimant. So number two is your call, not theirs. So if you remember um, the letter, and I'm gonna go back because this is really important. If you remember the letter, third, we provided an estimate by a third party vendor. See, they're saying right here, they're a third party independent and down here they're calling them an expert um, who advise that they're able to complete the work as estimated bringing your home you know up to snuff okay but look this is only if requested by you okay if you want it and you want somebody to do it then great you ask them i don't recommend it because you don't have as much control um but if you want it then you can ask them okay do the work okay Number three, reasonably adjust any written estimates prepared by the repair individual or entity of the insured's choice and provide a copy of the adjusted estimate to the claimant. So the problem with this is, so that because the adjuster didn't take the time, and I'm gonna go back to some of these estimates, okay? Um, because the adjuster didn't take the time to write a detailed estimate because he did this, okay? Lumped it all together instead of, taking the time and doing this. And I'm gonna tell you, this took me about, I don't know, about an hour. Um, it didn't take me that long. Once you get in the hang of it, there's a lot of um, repetitive steps you can take. But because he didn't do that, there's no way to compare, okay? And so this is really hard. So what, to me, what this triggers is them having to write a detailed estimate. So what I would do if I was in this situation is I would write back to them and I would cite this provision. I would say, I do not, I'm not requesting that you provide me with the name of a repair firm. Since I'm not requesting it, you have two choices, pay the difference or reconcile the estimates. And it's not your problem um, that he didn't or she didn't, sorry, um, write, a detailed, write a detailed estimate. Now, in a way, you know, your adjuster will probably go, well, the restoration company didn't write a detailed estimate either, you know, neener, neener, but um, that doesn't much matter. They don't, the restoration companies can bid what, whatever they want, really. It's not, you're not a hostage of the restoration companies. You can just go get another one if you, if you want a different one, but you're a hostage of your insurance company, basically. So there is no way. So if if you did if you did have a detailed estimate, okay, and you know that all these steps are going to be taken, okay, and that they're going to be taken for this amount, right? Then when you get your your um, these are the three restoration company estimates, you can say, okay, well this one's for the structure and contents only. Um, $6,700. I can afford to have the dwelling cleaned there. So I can, for this is Servpro, I can afford to have them do that. Um, that's fine. So then we just have to deal with the contents and the textiles and, and so forth. So um, that's how it's done. So NASA, the, it'd be nice if the restoration companies did detailed estimates and you might be able to ask them, especially if you know you're going to use them. Um, 
and some of the estimators are better than others, um, but that's, that's how you do it. And so what I would do is send this to them and say, you've got your choice of one or three, number one or three, which will it be? And you, they do not get to rely on number two, which is what that adjuster is doing. And he's saying, we have an expert, we're not gonna move, not one of your options. Your options are pay the difference or give us a reconciled um, estimate. And it's not your problem that they didn't write a good one in the beginning. Okay, um, I hope that makes sense. And I'm gonna, we're almost to the end, so I'll get to your questions really soon here. Um, this is just the, um, the backup, and some of you might have seen these before in our prior um, webinars, but this is the insurance code, the regulations that um, say that your insurance company cannot require to have your property claimed by a specific individual. Um, your insurer cannot suggest or recommend even that you have your property repaired by a service C. So to me, they're, they're pushing the envelope because, I mean, you're suggesting and recommending by bringing the restoration contractor with you on your inspection, okay? Um, and they sort of get around it by um, sending in writing of the right to repair your um, contractor. But here are, the, here are the areas of the regulations that have that. So, um, I, and I would say, I really feel strongly, if you were cut off your ALE because um, their restoration firm was available in three days and you, it doesn't even give you enough time to get an estimate from another restoration firm. To me, that's a huge conflict of interest and I would immediately, I, everyone who reports that to the Department of Insurance will be helping to stop that practice from happening. It'll not only help your claim probably, but it could stop the practice overall. I just don't believe it. Okay. Um, you know, partial losses, I just want you guys to know um, that I feel for you. It, it, it's an awful thing to say, but partial losses are harder than total losses with respect to getting your house restored. Um, total losses are obviously awful. A lot of attention is paid to um, total losses. Um, they put the experienced adjusters on the total losses. Um, they put the undertrained adjusters on your guys' losses. I, I just told some uh, manager from State Farm the other day, they should switch it around in the beginning and put the experienced adjusters on the smoke losses, put the new people on the totals to hand out um, advances while they're getting estimates and go about it. Um, but there's a lot of consideration. These are tough claims, okay guys? It's a difficult dynamic. You guys are concerned. Um, one of the things you're going to hear a lot is that, um, you know, each is a case by case basis. Okay. Um, and there is, you know, there's always a difference in the amount of smoke in a house. There's people who are more or less concerned, you know, to me, you know, the idea that somebody is trying to get over on an insurance company by, you know, having their house or their textiles cleaned is, is absurd. Um, your textiles in your house were, you know, clean before. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention, and this who pays reminds me, if your adjuster tells you you don't have enough damage for professional remediation, and you go out and you hire your own testing company that comes back and says, yes, you have damage, then I would send that bill directly to your insurance company and hammer them until they pay, okay? Because you were forced to do that by their... Um, premature and uninformed uh, denial of, of your benefits. So I would do that, okay? You need to make your case, make it clear and in writing, um, you know, re uh, request additional inspections, request forms, go up the chain of command, uh, complain to the Department of Insurance. So, and this is important, back up your request with documentation, okay, of your damages. I'm gonna say it again, get those restoration companies to write that you need to send your textiles out, that they need to be removed to the, from the house. If you think about it, so say you've got a closet, like my closet is kind of small, so it's kind of jammed. You can't clean the closet with the clothes in there, okay? And if they're gonna HEPA back every single item, you know, I, I would love to see that happen. If one of you is gonna have them do that and you wanna invite me over, I'll wear a mask, I'll mask up and I wanna watch them do the HEPA vacuuming, because in order to do it right, it would take a very long time on each piece of clothing. Think about vacuuming, you know, my shirt. If my shirt was covered in dust, think about how long it would take to vacuum it versus laundering it or having it sent out to a cleaner. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of absurd. So anyway, um, 
one, just a few more slides. Who manages the restoration? Okay, you or your contractor need to be in charge of the restoration, okay? Um, if you have a general contractor that you trust, um, that's fine, but you need to know you're in control. It's your house. You choose, you watch, you make sure everything gets done. Watch out for preferred contractors. Um, you know, that's just, you know, who prefers them. Sometimes it's helpful. You know, sometimes these preferred vendors can help people. There's a shortage of contractors, um, but you really need to make sure that you're in control. This is just a terrible picture of people putting debris on top of somebody else's chairs. You need to watch these people. Um, sometimes during disasters, good restoration companies might run out of, um, you know, otherwise good restoration companies might run out of laborers and hire people who are inexperienced and maybe not supervise them as well. And so things like this can happen. You need to be on top of it. Also, remove all your jewelry, all your paperwork, all your financial stuff, all your firearms, anything that you're super attached to, remove it so that there is no issue of you know, somebody touching it or something, okay? Um, last thing I wanna say, who warrants the work? Um, most of your insurers, even if you were to hire their preferred contractor, they do not guarantee contractors work. Um, let me tell you, um, I'm an expert witness in a lot of these cases, and the first thing that happens if somebody's complaining about the, you know, the, it, it happens a lot in water, but, you know, they're complaining that the work wasn't done properly, and the insurance company just points right at their contractor and says, it's their problem, they're the experts, you know, blah, 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 and they have no legal relationship, okay? Plus, you want to make sure that they have a liability insurance, that they have workers' comp for their workers, um, that they won't lien your property, get everything in writing. Okay. These are questions. I'm sorry I'm going through this fast, but I want to get to your questions. These are just make sure you ask your contractor and experts questions, okay? Um, uh, you need to make sure, are they certified to do what they're planning to do if it's specialized? Are they going to give you a, de a detailed estimate? Are they going to give you a schedule? Do they have supervisors? Do they have insurance, bonds, you know? Um, and all of that stuff. Do your due diligence. Um, I gave somebody a list of um, textile cleaners and they called the first one on the list, didn't ask them a single question, and then, you know, were surprised by some of the things. So you really need to know what to expect. Okay, resolving disputes, and I promise I'm right at the end here. Um, <sighs> What happens, you know, um, the restoration company, if the insurer brought them in, they did bad work, but they still want to get paid. Um, a lot of times, and there's a lot of issues I'm seeing on, um, there, everybody's going to ask you for two forms um, when you have a restoration company do the work. They're very standard. One is authorization to perform services. It lets the people come into your property, do the work. You know, it's basically a right of entry form. Um, and then they also a lot of times ask you for an authorization for payment, which allows um, the insurance company to name them on the payment. Um, the policy says that you know, they name you unless you authorize somebody else. So um, I have seen situations where the insurer brought in a restoration company, um, paid them directly without naming the, insurer, the insured and the policyholder saying, hey, look, half of the stuff on this list didn't even get done. It wasn't even done. Um, and you get into a big beef. So you really need to escalate those. And if it goes on, you need to get the Department of Insurance involved. Um, and I'll talk about them in a minute. Okay, know that you have re um, dispute resolution options. Go up the chain of command. Go to your, one of the state farm managers I talked to the other day says, you know, if I don't hear about it, I don't know about it. So if most of the um, letters, especially denial letters, have a manager's name and phone number at the bottom. Call them. Call them and do not let them go until you feel satisfied with their answers. Okay, so go to your adjuster, their superior management, tweet, you know, uh, file a complaint with the Department of Insurance. These are very frustrating sometimes. Sometimes people feel like they don't get um, any satisfaction, but know that. Even if it's something outside of the DOI's control, like they can't force these insurance companies to do something on a certain claim. We've got some, some issues with one insurance company and some paradise claims, and the DOI has come in and made a ruling and said, you are wrong insurance company, the policyholders are right, and the insurance company said, we don't care, we're going to stay with it. There's nothing they can do. Um, they can't, they're not a real enforcement arm, um, but, 
what has happened is, is you get everybody to make the complaint, then they can come in and do like a market conduct survey. They can come in and do an investigation into their overall business practices. So somewhere down the line, it will get fixed, okay? Um, you can hire a public adjuster. You know, they take a percentage. There's something called the appraisal uh, provision. Kind of expensive, kind of hard. I would try to do something before that. Um, and you can hire a lawyer, file a lawsuit, and you can go to mediation, arbitration. There is a wildfire mediation program with the Department of Insurance that if you re reach an impasse, you can ask for a free mediation. Um, I've heard, you know, all across the board on the results of that. It's as good as the mediator, but sometimes it really does help. Okay. If you file a lawsuit, um, it's pretty early. I would really recommend you guys trying to work it out with people. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to have a webinar on your legal rights, so it'll get more into it. Um, but there's a lot of questions to ask before you file a lawsuit. Okay. These are our best practices. You know, put everything in writing. That's the main thing. Everything in writing. Okay. Here's the information on the Department of Insurance. You can make a, um, a online complaint. Um, like I said, I recommend everybody do it for those things. Our website, you guys hopefully have seen this. This little search bar is your best friend. Um, you can look it up, okay? Um, I'm gonna get to the questions now. Thanks to our funders and partners, um, this Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County and the Napa Valley Community Foundation have given us grants that pay me to do this, so that's great. Here are our upcoming events tomorrow night, Claim Rules and Legal Rights. Amy Bach, our Executive Director, is going to be leading that one. Um, I am holding regular, we're gonna have a break next week because of, um, was it Veterans Day on the 11th? Um, but November 8th, this is kind of a free-for-all wildfire. Um, please try to stick to insurance. I'm only an insurance person. I don't do well with like, what's the county going to do with, you know, this permit and that permit. But I can try, but I'm not as good at that. Um, so this one's in November 18th. And then they're going to do a contents portion on November 19th. And you can sign up on our websites. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to go through your questions here and I'm just